So a little bit of background. I'm interested in the evolution of reproductive traits and what role they play in evolution and ecology. And about half my work is theoretical, mainly evolutionary theory using a variety of approaches. And the other half is empirical, um, mainly on this study organism, the oscillated RAS. So I'm going to tell you about two different pieces of theory that we've done in my group over the last few years. Um, and then I'll finish with some empirical uh, um, research that we've been doing and try to to finish off by telling you what theory I wish we had, or at least what theory the oscillated RAS tells me we need. Um, OK. So before I do that, um, the thing that really motivates me, the theory that I develop, I'm a biologist by training, is that I'm interested in the diversity of reproductive and social patterns that we see in nature. And so what you're looking at here are nine different species, all in the genus Symphidus, the main species that I've studied uh, over 20, tw more than 20 years now, uh, is the oscillated wrasse. And what's interesting about this group is that they all occur in the, the same ecological habitat. They're very closely related to each other. They radiated very rapidly when they came into the Mediterranean. And yet they have strikingly different reproductive patterns and social systems. So some of them have separate sexes, separate males and females, and some of them are sequential sex changers. Some of them have no parental care. Other, uh, others have very complex um, biparental care. Some of them have very simple social systems, and some of them have very complex social systems. And so you have these species that are living basically in the same habitat. And then the question is, why did these diverse patterns of reproduction and sociality evolve? And so this is kind of a backdrop um, uh, to, to think about what are we trying to understand. Um, so I'm interested th in this not just in this group, but across species in general. Why do we see different reproductive patterns, and what role does sociality or social interactions play in that? Um, so I know this is a diverse audience, so I want to first just talk about a little bit about sexual selection and male-female co-evolution. Um, so what you're looking at here are three different photographs of males and females. Females are on the left, males are on the right. Um, and when we think about sexual selection, we might think about male-male interactions or, or male-male competition driving the evolution of particular reproductive traits. So c people often hypothesize, for example, that horns and weapons are involved in sexual selection or have evolved due to sexual selection. But we also might think about the co-evolution between, for example, a male display trait, like this beautiful male peacock who's showing off his tail in front of the female, and then the evolution or the co-evolution of female preferences. Um, and so we think about how male and female traits co-evolve and how they're shaped by these sort of evolutionary processes. Um, but the thing that I have been thinking about for a long time is that all of these dynamics, interactions within and between the sexes, um, play out simultaneously. So male-male competition, for example, may shape not only things like horns, but also interactions between the sexes. And some of my early work focused on thinking about, you know, could you really understand male-female co-evolution in isolation from thinking about interactions within a sex? And to make a very long story short, you can't. You might get it wrong. Some of the time you'll be right, but some of the, some of the time you'll be wrong. But more, in, uh, more recently, we've been focused not, so just, uh, not just only on male-female co-evolution, but also the role that plasticity plays in those dynamics. So a lot of the theory on sexual selection, not all of it, but a lot of the theory on sexual selection has focused on the idea of sort of a male display trait and a female preference, or two traits that are fixed and co-evolving through evolutionary time. And the thing that we're interested in is when we think about those traits as actually arising in the context of a social interaction, does that change anything about the way we understand how those traits might evolve or the patterns that we'd expect to see? Um, another thing I'm interested in is the idea that social traits themselves might actually be sexually selected. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about the empirical work. Um, so we can think about sexual selection as arising from interactions between the sexes and within the sexes simultaneously, which is what this little cartoon is meant to represent. OK. So that's a quick introduction to sexual selection for those of you that haven't thought about it uh, as much as I have. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about how we might think about social plasticity in general before I talk about some of the theory that I want to introduce here today. Um, so in a general sense, when we talk about plasticity, really all we mean is that there's some environmental cue. This could be temperature. This could be food abundance. It could also be the social environment, like the number of competitors. And some aspect of the phenotype, a behavior that you observe or a trait that you observe. And really when we say plasticity, all we really mean is that something changes, that the phenotype changes in response to the environment. Okay? Um, but when we think, think about social environments, we might think about behavioral plasticity. And plasticity can arise either between 
individuals that share the genotype, so this identical genotypes might exhibit different behaviors in different environments, or we might also think about how the behavior of an individual changes over either rapid or longer time periods. So plasticity can be both within an individual over time or between individuals that share a genotype. And a really traditional way of representing these is using a reaction norm approach, which is this idea that you can predict the phenotype from some aspect of the environment. And the slope of this line is used to represent the degree to which organisms are plastic or responsive to the environment. So you might imagine that you could talk about certain genotypes being more plastic than others. If each of these lines represents a genotype, you can think about not only that the plasticity exists, but also that the slope of that line, which captures how plastic they are, that that could also evolve over evolutionary time. Okay? Um, so this is sort of a reaction norm framework for thinking about plasticity. So the first piece of theory that I want to talk about today is asking a very general question, which is when traits are plastic in response to the social environment, how or does that change um, sort of the evolutionary dynamics that you expect to see? Uh, and this work was done in collaboration with two of my postdocs, Zerem Kazanjolo and Hope Klug. Okay. Um, so I already showed you that sort of reaction norm framework, and now I want to talk about how we actually model it. this. This is a quantitative genetic framework, um, looking for the evolution of these social reaction norms. And so instead of just having the environment here, we might, for example, have the trait value in a social partner. You can think about this as the degree of aggressiveness or the amount of uh, courtship, if you're thinking about a hating behavior. And then you can think about how a focal individual responds to that trait value in their social partner. So, for example, degree of aggressiveness might be met by an increase in aggressiveness as well between two social partners, okay? And again, the slope of the line captures the degree of plasticity that we expect to see, and this is often represented in this uh, indirect genetic effects quantitative genetic framework that we use uh, as psi. Psi is just the slope of that line. You can think of it as the degree of plasticity. So Alan Moore and colleagues did some theory in the late 90s that asked when plasticity is present, when individuals are plastic in response to the social environment, how does that affect what we would predict about the rate of evolutionary change? Okay? And so I want to walk you through the sort of main prediction that they made using a bit of a cartoon on this graph here. So if this is um, sort of the reaction norm, we can think about evolutionary change in the mean trait values as a change along this axis. What it, how does this trait change over evolutionary time? Or how does this trait change over evolutionary time? So I want you to think about this red dot as representing not an individual, but the mean in the population at any point in time. Okay? So if there's positive directional selection favoring an increase, for example, in this trait value in the population, so you would predict an evolutionary change over time, what they argued is that given this reaction norm or given this plasticity, even if there's no genetic change in the other trait, you would observe a phenotypic change in the second trait of interest. And so this adds sort of another level of evolutionary response, and what you get is that the rate of evolution is accelerated in the presence of plasticity compared to in the absence of plasticity. Only, this is only for the case for social plasticity because individuals are reacting to the traits in other individuals. Okay? So made, they made the argument that plasticity would accelerate the rate of evolution but not change what you predicted to evolve. So it wouldn't, predict, it wouldn't change the direction of selection, but it would change uh, how quickly it happened. And so, uh, my colleagues, uh, my postdocs and I were sitting around and talking about this theory and thinking about um, plasticity and how we might model it. And we realized that this um, looked at when plasticity is present, how it might change things. But what we really wanted to do is look at the evolution of plasticity. So if plasticity is not just present, but can actually evolve and respond to selection, how would that change the inference we would draw? Okay. So I'm going to show you again in sort of this cartoon form, and then I'll show you some uh, um, actual results from the model. So imagine instead that we start off with some uh, sort of average trait value of these two social traits of interest, and we're looking at a situation where there's directional change, sorry, sorry positive directional selection on that trait. We would predict that that trait would change over evolutionary time. But if we now allow for the fact that the slope of this line can also evolve, that there can be selection on plasticity itself, you might get a change in the reaction norm, which could even lead to an, a, a change in the opposite direction that you would expect, for example, in that other trait. And so this is, this is just a cartoon now to capture this idea that when the reaction norm also changes, it can alter the evolutionary dynamics that we'd expect to see. And so this was the question that we were interested in, is if we allow for selection on the reaction norm, if we allow for the evolution of plasticity, how does that change our, the inference we would draw 
uh, about the rates of evolution. So the first uh, result that I want to um, show you here today is looking at what's called a non-reciprocal interaction. That means where one trait affects uh, the other trait, but there's not a two-way interaction. So you can imagine that level of aggression, for example, might affect parental effort, or some aspect of mating behavior might influence parental care behavior, something like that. Um, and so what I'm going to show you again is the predicted evolutionary trajectories for the change in, in, in uh, one trait and the change in another trait. And I want to show you these, re the results I'm showing you is for where there's positive directional selection on both traits. So all else equal, we would, we would expect an increase in the mean value of both traits, assuming that there's some heritability to them. Okay. So here are the evolutionary trajectories. These are predicted using a quantitative genetic framework in a classic breeder's equation. Um, but we've allowed for the fact that both traits, the traits can evolve, and the slope of that line or the psi value. Uh, can evolve as well. Each of these dar dots is sort of a hypothetical starting point. A po you start a population at a certain mean trait value, and you predict over evolutionary time how those two traits on average are expected to change. The length of the line shows the amount of evolutionary change in this trait space, if you will, um, and each of these trajectories is for the same amount of evolutionary time. Okay? And so the dotted line is uh, sort of um, capturing that Alan Moore et al. Uh, dynamic where plasticity is, isn't evolving or where there's no selection of uh, plasticity. And so if there's positive directional selection on both traits, you just predict an increase in both mean trait values. Um, but the other two lines are showing where you would have either positive or negative selection on plasticity. So selection for greater plasticity or weaker plasticity. And what we find then is that both the direction and the amount or the rate of evolutionary change is influenced by this fact that plasticity itself can also evolve. Okay? All right, I want to show you one other uh, result of this work. Now I want to show you the situation where there are reciprocal interactions, meaning that two social traits interact with one another. Um, you can think of this as mating and parental effort if you're someone like me who thinks about these things all the time. But you can choose any social traits of interest uh, for yourself. And so now, instead of having just one reaction norm, there's actually two reaction norms. There's two traits that are plastically responding uh, to uh, each other. Um, and I'm going to show you that same basic pattern where we're going to predict these evolutionary trajectories under the assumption of positive directional selection on both traits. And here are the predicted evolutionary trajectories. So again, the, the dotted line is under the assumption of plasticity being fixed. The reaction norms are present, but they are not allowed to evolve. And you get a small amount of evolutionary change in that situation. And the other lines show different po combinations of positive and negative selection um, on the slope of those lines. Okay? And so you can see that not only the length of the lines, but also the direction that they go uh, differ. Now, this is a very abstract model. We're not trying to think about um, sort of making specific predictions about uh, traits of interest. The thing I want you to take away from this is that when we allow for the pl fact that plasticity itself may be evolving or co-evolving with these traits, it can fundamentally change the rate and direction of evolutionary change. Okay. When you're thinking about selection of plasticity, is that independent of the selection you're thinking about on these traits? Yeah, so this is just putting a selection gradient into a quantitative genetic model. Yeah, we've been working on ones where there's actually a fitness, um, you know, a fitness landscape as a function of the actual behavioral interactions in the context. For me, it's in the context of mating and parental care because that's what I'm interested in. Um, but no, this is just in a breeder's equation with a particular selection gradient assumed a priori. Yeah, so we're not predicting that this trajectory would happen, but we're saying that that is a possible tra trajectory if you had a fitness landscape, landscape that selected for an increase in plasticity in one trait and a decrease in plasticity in another trait. Does that answer the question? Okay, can you say something about fitness? Actually, so this is... A bit more details about fitness. Um, so what this is... The, the selection gradients are just parameters that we fed into the model. So this is, you're not deriving selection gradients. In, in this approach, we're not deriving selection gradients from a fitness landscape. We're just asking if there was a particular selection differential on um, that, the, the slope of that line on the reaction norm, how would that change the evolutionary dynamics? So it is admittedly the first step in hopefully many <laughs> models looking at how social plasticity might evolve. And so to be very clear, the motivation here was to take the exact same framework that Alan Moore and Jason Wolf and others have been using to argue that plasticity won't change the, the direction of evolution but will accelerate it and say if we just add, if we change this one thing, which is we allow for the slope of the line to change as well, how does that change the dynamics? And I hope I've convinced you at least that it fundamentally changed, changes the predictions potentially in terms of the rate. 
I'm sorry? Is the mathematical model nonlinear? Is it nonlinear? Um, not, no, the Breeders' equation is not nonlinear in the way that it's, that it's uh, derived. Because only at the very beginning it will be linear. If you try to go further, you will fail. The model needs to be nonlinear from the very beginning. All right, well, I didn't, I didn't set out to reinvent quantitative genetics, so I used the <laughs> quantitative genetic framework, but I appreciate, I appreciate the point. Uh, okay. So I, I show you that piece of theory really just to convince you, hopefully, that thinking about social plasticity might be important even if you don't care about plasticity at all. That plasticity could potentially change the, the evolutionary trajectories of whatever your question of interest is. So that even if you're not studying them, they might be potentially important uh, to the question that, that you're interested in. But one of the things that I think is coming out of these questions that I would fully acknowledge is that this is a grand... Um, uh, abstraction of what we know that organisms actually do. I will admit that this framework is dissatisfying to me when I wear my empirical hat. It's very tractable, but it doesn't capture what we know organisms can do. And so I would argue that a challenge for all of us is to develop theory that can actually more um, genuinely capture the patterns of plasticity, particularly social plasticity, that we know that organisms are capable of. Um, so there's a lot of work yet to be done. Okay. So um, I want to tell you about another piece of theory that looks at plasticity from a very different, uh, a very different way. Instead of trying to look at plasticity um, in general or as a whole, I want to look at one very particular problem or one very particular question in my field. Um, and this actually uses an optimality approach. So it's a different way of thinking about how we might uh, predict plasticity. Um, so I want to focus now on um, theory that looks at patterns of optimal female allocation. And I'll give you a little bit of background on the field. But the idea is that people have proposed uh, and observed empirically is that sometimes females will change how they allocate to their current brood or their current offspring um, uh, in response to who they mate with. Okay? Um, so there's really two bodies of com uh, competing theory. Um, and one of them predicts that if there's, for, imagine that there's some sort of variation in male quality. You can think of this as the quality of the male genetically, or but also the quality of the parental care that they uh, exhibit. And you might think about how much a female will invest in her current brood. And some people have argued, um, Nancy Burley, Bart Kempenars, and Ben Sheldon have all argued that if you have a higher quality male, females might invest more in their current brood. So sort of taking advantage of a high quality male when you mate with them. Um, and they might have lower total investment in the current brood when mated to uh, a low-quality male. Um, but Patty Gowati and, uh, and others have made, in, in many ways, the opposite argument. And this, is called, this theory is called reproductive compensation. And the idea is, in, when mated to a low-quality male, the female might compensate by either providing more parental care or investing more in terms of making higher-quality eggs uh, or larger numbers of offspring. And that they might actually invest less when mated uh, to a lower-quality male. And so these two theories, although they differ a little bit in the assumptions and the, and the way that they're phrased, they really make opposite, uh, opposite predictions for how a female should respond uh, in terms of a variation in male quality. Um, the original theory that I'm uh, sort of presenting here was purely verbal. And there's actually only previously one piece of mathematical theory that looked at sort of these two hypotheses for how females might respond. It was done back in 2009. And they basically argued, they did a dynamic state variable model, and they argued that differential allocation, meaning an increase in allocation with increasing male quality, would be relatively, would be common, would be the most common pattern, and that this reproductive compensation would be relatively rare. Um, but when we started looking at the empirical literature, what we found is that what we actually observe is much, is, is highly variable. So some, in some species, they found evidence for uh, differential allocation. In others, they found evidence for reproductive compensation. In some very pesky species, they actually found evidence for both simultaneously. So females would um, invest more in parental care, but invest less in terms of numbers of offspring. And, and so the empir empirical data and the ability of these two theories to explain that empirical data were incredibly mixed. And so one of the things that um, my student, 
and I noticed was that people were measuring very different things. So sometimes they would, they would measure the amount of parental care, sometimes they would measure uh, the number of eggs produced, sometimes they would measure the, you know, the size of each egg. And so there really wasn't sort of a consistency in actually how m people were measuring maternal investment. But there was a lot of striking and interesting empirical variation. And for me, when you see that kind of, um, when you see theories that basically cannot capture the empirical variation, that's usually a clue to me that we're missing something. Uh, and so we asked ourselves uh, what that might be. Um, so I want to tell you about the theory that my student and I did together, but I first want to just give you a little bit of background on why it's actually a little bit of a puzzle to think about differential allocation in general. Um, so uh, what you're looking at here is a representation of a classic model from life history theory, which is often called the smith fretwell model, um, that asks how, in just in general, how much should individuals invest in current reproduction and what's the optimal offspring size? Okay? And so the idea here is that if you make larger offspring, for example, if you go from small to large offspring, the fitness or the expected survival of those offspring are going to increase the more you put in it, but with some diminishing reserves. So you can think about this as if, if the amount of energy you pack into a yolk of an egg, for example, if you're a bird, the more you put in, the higher the probability on average that that offspring might survive. But at some point for each unit of energy you put in, it kind of, it kind of um, flattens out, if you will. <laughs> Yeah, it's a sigmoidal curve, yep. And so um, what, what Smith uh, and Fretwell showed is that if you thought about it from the parent's perspective, if the sort of increase in per, um, per offspring effort increases individual offspring survival, but there's a trade-off between how many offspring you can make and how much energy you pack into each one, then there's actually a single optimal offspring size for a given environment, which is basically at the tangent of the curve. So it's much like a, a marginal value theorem in terms of the prediction. So what that would mean is that from a female's perspective, in the same ecological environment, your baseline expectation might be that they should always make the same size of offspring, but they, if they get extra energy, they should just make more of them. So the conventional wisdom has been that really there's some optimal offspring size, and it shouldn't vary uh, depending on who you mate with or what your male is. That's the sort of classic life history theory. Um, but, oh, and this is the optimal offspring size, okay. Um, but the pesky thing is that despite that conventional wisdom, that is not what organisms actually do. So we know that they actually adjust the amount that they allocate per offspring, both in terms of pre-fertilization uh, pre and in terms of parental care. They adjust that investment, um, not only in response to the environment, but also in response to the social conditions and who they mate with. Okay? So there's a puzzle to be solved from an empirical perspective. Um, so in collaboration with my uh, student at the time, uh, Holly Kinsvater, she's now faculty at, at uh, Rutgers, um, uh, we set out to model, uh, uh, to have a, a model of sort of optimal plasticity and maternal allocation, and we wanted to think about all the different ways that males might affect offspring survival and fitness. Okay? And so the model is, um, it's a dynamic state variable model. It's solved using dynamic programming, for those of you that know what, what that is and uh, have an interest in it. Um, it looks at a trade-off between current and future reproduction. So there's a trade-off between reproducing now and reproducing in the future. And there's some energy reserves that females have available to them. And they can use those energies either in the current brood or in future broods. Okay, so that's sort of an assumption of the model. And we allowed females to allocate not just in total to the current brood, but between offspring size and number. So they could package that energy either into a smaller number of well-invested offspring or a larger number of poorly invested offspring. Um, we also assumed that they could uh, adjust their investment in response to the male that they had mated with. Okay, so this is, does assume that they have some information about the quality of male that they've mated with, some cue that predicts male quality. And we explored a wide variety of paternal effects. Males might affect the um, survival of the offspring. They might have an effect on growth rate of offspring um, or some other sort of measure of size and, and offspring fitness. Um, we didn't actually pr try to predict in this model, to be clear, what the optimal female preference should be. We just assumed that given that they mated with a certain type of male, how should they respond to that? So our focus was on optimal allocation given a certain mate, not who they should mate with a priori. Um, okay, so this is the dynamic uh, programming equation. I don't want to go into it in, into too much detail, but there's a current um, reproductive success and future reproductive success, and you maximize across both optimal offspring size and optimal offspring number using dynamic programming or backward induction. Okay. All right, so 
remember that uh, differential allocation would predict that with a better male, they should invest more in the current brood, and reproductive compensation would predict the opposite, meaning that higher quality males, females should decrease their investment in the current brood. So what you're looking at here is the predicted optimal offspring size. Um, each line is a different sort of optimal size of offspring. Don't worry about what the numbers mean. They're relatively abstract, but just relative allocation per offspring. Um, and we looked at two different potential paternal effects. So offspring growth growth rate might increase with higher quality males, or offspring survival might increase with higher quality males. So you might think, for example, that if males are better parents, better at defending the nest, they might, higher quality males might lead to higher offspring survival. But if males are, for example, better at feeding the offspring in the nest, that might affect offspring growth rate, just hypothetically speaking. Okay? So, and each of these lines is sort of a, a predicted optimal allocation from the female's perspective. All right. This, n we're, we, we modeled it as a direct effect, yeah. Um, but it's, a, it's an optimization model rather than uh, a, a quantitative genetic model that you're predicting over evolutionary time. So really a paternal effect, it doesn't matter to this model if it's genetic or not. It's a phenotypic model, so you're not tracking you know, uh, gene frequencies, allele frequencies. It could be that it's a heritable effect on offspring growth or size, but we're really just looking at the effect on the offspring rather than the cumulative effect over evolutionary time. Does that help? Okay. Um, so you would have the same basic predictions, um, given that we're not trying to predict female preference. It would really matter if you were trying to predict female preference, yeah. Um, and so what I want to point out here is that if you imagine a female, for example, who is mated to uh, a low quality versus a high quality male when the paternal effect affects offspring uh, survival, you actually would predict that she should increase, when she goes from low quality to high quality male, she should increase her optimal, or her, she should increase her, her investment per offspring. Optimal offspring size goes up. However, if you think about the perspective when the paternal effect is actually affecting uh, offspring growth, the prediction goes in the opposite way. Okay? And so what we find here is that given what kind of, or dependent on what kind of paternal effect there is, um, we actually get opposite directions for the predictions in terms of whether or not it supports the reproductive compensation hypothesis or whether or not it, it supports the differential allocation hypothesis. Okay, so I don't want you to, don't worry too much about the, all of the details in this graph, but we looked at a wide variety of different ways that males are known to affect offspring fitness from things like nuptial gifts where they feed the female, um, male effects on offspring growth rate and survival and uh, various combinations of different assumptions. And what I want you to notice over here, so remember an increase in, in allocation would be consistent with differential allocation and a decrease would be consistent uh, with reproductive compensation. There are a wide variety of cases where, those, where we get that basic pattern, where the predictions go in opposite directions. And so what that means, if people have been testing this theory and we've been getting these equivocal results, it's because they haven't been separating those two out. Sometimes we would predict a change in the number of offspring. Sometimes we would predict a change in the optimal offspring size. And they can even go in opposite directions. Okay? So it helps us understand a little bit more where this empirical variation may be coming from. And so um, I think Holly and I made ourselves a little bit unpopular with some of the people who had been working on this theory because one of the things that I think this points out and that we wrote about in the paper is that means that the whole concept of having these two competing hypotheses is, is basically useless. And that there's actually sort of, we need one theory of maternal investment that isn't trying to differentiate between those two. They're not two competing hypotheses, but sort of special cases of each other. Um, and so I think that helps us at least understand why the empirical results are so equivocal. Um, and, and basically it means that we need to move away from competing these two theories against one another. Um, it also uh, points out that the kind of paternal effect, the way the male affects the offspring, is really important and is a parameter that at least as a empiricist we need to measure more. We often you know, have this abstract sense of what male quality means um, in this context, uh, not in the human context. And um, we, you know, we, we say male quality, but we aren't really measuring anything that, that we know is affecting offspring fitness. And so I would argue that at least in this field, this is one of the parameters that we really need to measure more empirically because without it, you can't really make concrete predictions about what sort of maternal response or plasticity of maternal allocation 
you'd expect to see. Um, admittedly, another reason that I chose to talk about this example is that these are two really different fr frameworks for thinking about plasticity. So on one hand, we thought about plasticity as this very abstract thing that could evolve, um, but was built into a quantitative genetic framework. And in this framework, we're actually looking at what we would call ideal or perfect plasticity, right? I haven't constrained what the female can do or what she knows, anything about the cues that are available to her, but I can predict the pattern of plasticity I'd expect to evolve under no constraints. Okay, so these are two different ways that people have thought about plasticity. Um, so just keep that in, in mind. So I want to shift gears now. I talked about two different pieces of theory that hopefully illustrate the different ways that we can use theory to think about plasticity in the context of reproduction and, and interactions between the sexes. Um, and I now want to introduce you to my main study species, the oscillated wrasse, um, which you're looking at here. Um, it is a Mediterranean fish. It's found throughout the Mediterranean. Um, it, is, uh, it has three alternative male reproductive tactics, which is why I first started studying it way back when. Um, so what you're looking at here is a large nesting male. These males, um, large is a relative term. They're about eight centimeters in length. They're bright. They're colorful. They build nests out of algae. Um, all of the reproduction in the species occurs in these nests that they build. Um, the males court females, bring them to the nest. Uh, they provide parental care, at least most of the time, and then the larvae hatch and go out into the open ocean. Um, without male parental care, those offspring will die. So male parental care is, is necessary for offspring survival in this system. There's also a classic sneaker male that exists in the species. These males don't build nests, they don't court females, they don't provide parental care. And they are small, and they look very similar to a female, but I can promise you that they can tell one another apart, so they're not a true female mimic, for those of you that study these kind of things, um, and that males and females can definitely tell one another apart. The sneaker males basically swim in when a nesting male and female are spawning, release sperm, and then swim off. Um, they do hang around nests, but they don't do anything else. They don't provide any parental care, and there's no long-term pair bond between males and females in the system. Um, the species also has this uh, third male type called a satellite male, which are a little more particular to this species. They're intermediate in both size and color pattern. Um, they have a little bit of color. They uh, um, uh, hang around nests with the nesting male, and I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the things we've learned about them recently. Um, but they chase sneakers away from the nest, but they also do this sort of parasitic spawning where they swim in when the nesting male and female are spawning and try to fertilize uh, eggs. Um, let me think about what else I need to tell you. Uh, females um, move around and choose a particular nest to lay their eggs in. They can produce a new clutch of eggs every two to three days, and the breeding season is about um, two months in length. And nesting males will go through a series of what we call nest cycles, where they build a nest, they spawn in it, and they provide parental care. And about one-third of those males will actually desert their nest before providing parental care, which means all of the eggs in the nest will, will die or be eaten by other fish. Um, and the three alternative male types seem to be uh, determined by growth, so early pre-reproductive growth. Um, all nesting males are two years old, all sneaker males are one year old, and satellites are a mixture of the two. And so the data we have implies or seems to suggest that if you grow slowly, you start your life as a sneaker male, and then you're, if you're lucky to live, enough, live long enough to a second year, you become a satellite male. If you go, grow quickly as a juvenile, you may start your life as a satellite male, but then switch uh, in your second year to becoming a nesting male. So it's a, a size-dependent or growth-dependent life history trajectory. And while there could be a genetic basis to variation in size, it's not a simple genetic polymorphism in terms of the way it arises. And it's consistent with it being purely size or growth dependent. Okay. So um, if you study sexual selection, one of the first things you have to ask yourself when you go out to study a new species is, is there even a potential for sexual selection to be operating? You know, when we look, if you're, if you're someone like me, and you look and you see a male like this that's courting females, that has these bright color patterns, that one of the first things you think about is that these traits are likely sexually selected. They seem to be involved in sexual selection. Um, what you're looking at here is the distribution of mating success among nests. So the orange bars are observed frequencies of different levels of uh, spawning rates or mating rates uh, in a given observation. And the blue line is what you'd expect under random mating based on the assumption of a Poisson process. So if females are mating at random, this is the distribution you'd expect to see. And we get a significant deviation from the this distribution we'd expect under random mating. So there's the potential, at least, for sexual selection to be operating this species. And there's the potential for these traits to maybe explain some of this variation in mating success. Okay. 
Um, but unfortunately, for me at least, the story is not that simple. So I'm about to summarize about a decade of my life in a single animated slide. <laughs> but what I'll tell you about very quickly is what we've learned about what drives that skewed distribution of mating success. So I can tell you all the things that isn't. It isn't male color pattern, so it's not the, the brightness of the nesting male. It's not the rate at which he courts females. It's not where he puts his nest or what he builds it out of. It actually has nothing to do with the identity of the nesting males. Females strongly prefer nesting males over sneaker and satellite males, so they prefer the nesting male phenotype. But when it comes to the nesting male, they really don't care which nesting male it is. In fact, we've done experiments where we remove the nesting male and females just keep spawning at that nest with whatever new nesting male comes in and takes over the nest. So nesting male identity is not actually under strong sexual selection. Okay. So what then does drive that skewed distribution of mating success? Um, so one of the things we might ask then is if there's a bunch of nests, where does a female choose to spawn? One of the things that we found using a combination of observational and experimental studies that I'd be happy to talk about in detail, but we just probably don't have time to do today, is that if you ask a female where she is going to spawn, the best predictor of where she will choose to spawn is she will spawn in the presence of other females or in the presence of other recently laid eggs. So if a female is choosing between two nests that are otherwise identical, she will always choose to go to the nest where there's a higher mating rate or there are more females around. Um, once females have made that choice, it sets off a positive feedback loop, so you get a beginning of that skewed distribution. And then sneakers and satellites, not being particularly dumb, map onto the distribution of mating success. They go where the females are. And so that original choice that that first female made can lead to this incredibly skewed distribution of mating success. And we've actually been able to show that it's female mate choice copying, where they actually copy the mate choice of the first females or the early females that are choosing among nests. So it isn't actually a male-male competition or male-female interactions that drive the skewed distribution of mating success. It's actually female-female interactions in this species. So females copying the choice of other females. And in case you're wondering why they do that or why that makes sense, we've also been able to show that males that have higher mating success are much more likely to stay with their nests. So it doesn't matter if we do it observationally or if we, experience, ex we experimentally make some males more successful than others. Successful males are very likely to stay and take care of the offspring. Males that don't have very many eggs in their nests are likely to, to desert and leave their young, which then means that they'll be eaten by other eggs. So there's probably strong selection for females to actually choose where other females are going, um, which is maybe you know, not the norm in birds and mammals, for example. Yes. So... <laughs> This is why it's a decade of my life, yes. So um, the short answer is no. There is no variable that I have looked at that predicts any of that variation of mating success other than the presence of other females is a good thing and the presence of sneakers is a bad thing right, in terms of the statistical analyses. Um, the other thing I would say is that imagine that the first female does choose based on a male characteristic like color or body size or whatever would make more sense to us you would still detect that statistically even if all the other females exhibit mate choice copying, right? Because if the first female goes out and finds the reddest or largest or prettiest male she can and everyone else follows her, you would still expect there to be a significant statistical relationship between some male trait and where females choose to spawn. So I cannot rule out the 100 million things that we could probably think of that it might be, but if there is something that explains where females go other than other females, it has to be something that's ephemeral. It can't be something that's fixed about that male or that nest, um, because otherwise you would, should be able to t detect it in the, in the data. Yeah, Susan. Sorry, could you also say that um, females are choosing among sisters, not together because they're attracted to each other, but they're more likely to be attracted to it's So it's very possible that there's um, additionally a dilution effect in the sense that if you put all your eggs in one basket, if you will, that, that those offspring have higher survival. But what we know is that um, when a male is incredibly successful, when he has a large number of eggs in his nest, he has a very high probability of remaining with that nest and providing parental care. When he has few eggs in the nest, he's very likely to desert it and start the whole process over again. So dilution might be an additional component, um, but we, but that's not anything I've ever been able to find significant evidence for. It's possible, but if it is an effect, it's a weak effect that we haven't been able to detect. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question I have with regards to the, some of the ideas. 
create a concentration so you have more sensation going into that spot. And the fact that you can raise the best reading surface is actually very quality of the net light that's going into the cell. So Um, you know, I assume, just biologically speaking, that there's probably an upper bound on, you know, the number of, of eggs that do well in a nest, but I can tell you that we've never detected it. So they never get to that upper bound in terms of the number of larvae that, uh, there's no relationship between the number of, you know, the mating success in a nest and the, and the proportion of larvae that, that hatch out of it, at least that we've been able to find. Um, in terms of predation, the only, so there are, uh, the most common predator on the, on the eggs are other oscillated wrasses and other species in the genus. And the nesting male plays a really important role in chasing them away. So actually a male that has more eggs in his nest is more likely to provide high quality parental care. So it actually is a positive relationship. More eggs and means um, less, sorry, a negative relationship. More eggs means less likelihood of predation. Um, uh, sorry, there was another part to your question that I've forgotten. I was assuming that higher density fish. Oh, higher, higher density. Yeah, so, the, oh, so that we, we, I will say that um, when it comes to predation at the nest, the only successful predation I have ever seen was on a female who was waiting to spawn in a nest. Um, so that, you know, having a lot of other adult females around does have a, a, a weak negative effect on... Um, oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so it's li like a harem. It is like what we would call a lek, except, except it's a lek with parental care. Oops. Um, so it's a very skewed distribution of mating success. And one, there's winners and losers in this system, right? So some males have very high mating success and some males have very low mating success, which, um, but there's no defense of the females. Females just come in and go and do their thing. Okay. Um, so this, you know, uh, <laughs> as was clear from all these questions, is a somewhat puzzling pattern. It's not what we necessarily, it's not the classic example of sexual selection. Um, I'd like to think it's maybe a non-model organism, which will force us to think more clearly about how sexual selection works. But one of the things that it led me to think about was whether or not social traits themselves could actually be sexually selected. Um, so this, this cartoon was really um, to motivate the idea that it's, been got, it's got my group thinking more and more about the role that social interactions and social traits play in sexual selection um, and, how that, and how that might work. So I wanna shift gears a little bit and return to um, this idea of male-male competition being important in sexual selection and talk about those satellite males that I sort of hinted I would come back to. So there, there are these three alternative male types that reproduce in the system. Um, and uh, one of the things that's been hypothesized that those, those satellite males might be a cooperative strategy. They might be a helper helping out the nesting male. Um, so there's been, you know, traditionally we think of cooperation as arising in systems, for example, where relatives are helping relatives, but there's increasing evidence of cooperation evolving in systems where individuals are unrelated to uh, one another. Um, so probably the best known example are the long-tailed mannequins that Emily Duvall and colleagues have studied, where there's actually an alpha and beta male, um, and they perform their courtship song and dance together. Um, but only the alpha male will mate. So the beta male never mates when he's in the beta male role. Um, but a female will only accept an alpha male if he has a beta male and if they perform this two-part uh, two interaction, which is really puzzling <laughs> if you think about it um, because there's no direct fitness effect, no, no direct fitness advantage to that beta male. But more and more people have been thinking about the fact that male reproductive cooperation does seem to be found empirically, although it is still somewhat of a puzzle um, from an evolutionary perspective. We assume that there must be some long-term benefits to the reproductive cooperation, um, but it's often hard in systems like the, the mannequins, which live for a very long time, to really be able to estimate what those, what those um, long-term fitness effects might be. Um, but in the oscillated RAS, one of the things that, that people had hypothesized when they first observed this satellite male was that maybe they're like a beta male. Maybe they're helping the nesting male bring females to the nest. But the alternative possibility is that they are the nesting male's worst nightmare, meaning that they are the dominant sneaker male. They're very aggressive. They, um, actually, they have a very large gonad if you cut them open, so we know they're capable of fertilizing offspring. And so there's sort of this possibility that they're the beta male, the helper male, if you will, but there's also the possibility that they are the nesting male's worst competitor, that they actually take the most uh, fertilizations away from the nesting male. And so we wanted to do some experiments to actually explore what is the role of the satellite male in this system? Um, and this work was done in uh, collaboration with my then postdoc, uh, Kelly Stiver. 
So I'm just going to tell you about one experiment that we did. Um, and in this experiment, we went to nests that had a satellite male on sneaker males present. Um, and we did an observation before any kind of manipulation. We then uh, removed the satellite male, so we just took the satellite male away, and we asked what changes at the nest when the satellite male isn't present. We also did a sham manipulation um, as a control for the uh, manipulation effect, where we basically did the exact same thing, except we didn't actually take the satellite male away. We allowed him to stay. We did the same level of disruption. We pretended to catch him very badly, then we let him go, and we looked at what the changes in behavior were uh, when the satellite male was still present. So remember, the, um, the two possibilities that we're thinking about is that the satellite male might be a helper, he might have a positive effect on the nesting male's fitness, or he might have a negative effect on the nesting male's fitness. And we're going to look at this here as um, the hypothesis is that they're changing the risk of sperm competition. So maybe the, we've seen the satellite male chases away sneaker males, maybe his presence actually has a positive net effect on the nesting male by decreasing the sperm competition from sneakers. Um, and that's, in fact, exactly what we found. So uh, this is a change in the risk of sperm competition before versus after. And there's an increase in the risk of sperm competition when we take that satellite male away. Right? If he was the, the worst competitor from the nesting male's perspective, you should actually see the change in sperm competition go in the opposite direction. Taking him away takes away a lot of the sperm competition that the nesting male experiences. And it actually shifts the reproductive skew at the nest, giving more fitness, taking fitness from the sneaker males, and basically giving it to the nesting male. So the presence of the satellite male actually has, is sexually selected in the sense that it has a net fitness gain um, for the nesting male. Okay, Does that make sense? All right. Um, so one of the things that I've been I um, looking at and interested in as a result of that uh, pattern that we found is if having a satellite male is good, then maybe attracting a high-quality satellite male is actually in itself sexually selected. Maybe the social interaction between the nesting male is actually under strong sexual selection, possibly for both of them. And so that's one of the ideas that we've been exploring most recently. And I'm just going to tell you about two different results we have. Um, we know that satellite males vary in the amount that they court females or chase sneaker males away. We also know they vary in the amount that they try to mate with those females. And so you can imagine that there might be higher quality or lower quality satellite males. And from the nesting male's perspective, they're going to have higher fitness if they actually attract a high quality satellite male to their nest. Um, so one of the things we were interested in is, remember, these satellite males not vary not only in age, but they also vary in size. And you might be interested in knowing, you're, if you're a nesting male, do you want a larger or a smaller satellite male? So one of the things we looked at is the spawning rate, or the proportion of spawns in which the satellite male was involved, as a function of their length or body size. And so it increases with body size, although there is granted a lot of uh, variation. There is a significant relationship between body size, satellite male size, and the amount that they're attempting or that they're managing um, to take fertilizations away from the nesting male. So if you're a nesting male, all else equal, a smaller satellite male partner would lead to higher fertilization success for the nesting male. We've also looked at uh, circulating levels of testosterone. This is 11 keto testosterone, which is the fish homolog of mammalian testosterone. And we found that satellite males with higher levels of testosterone uh, are more likely to invest a lot of energy or a lot of time uh, chasing away sneaker males. They're more aggressive to sneaker males. And so if you were a, a, a nesting male attempting to attract a satellite male partner, all else equal, you would want a small one that has a high level of testosterone circulating through their system. Um, so these are some of the things that that we're beginning to explore, and we're actually trying to measure sexual selection on the social interaction itself, which is um, a little bit more complicated than I, th than I thought it would be, um, so it's taking a few years to get there. But we have evidence that there is sexual selection on this social interaction and this partnership. Okay, so um, I just want to take uh, a moment to sort of summarize and uh, sort of touch on what, uh, the, what I think all of this might mean in a bigger picture. Um, so I hope I convinced you that thinking about social interactions and social plasticity might be important if you're interested in evolutionary dynamics and the rate and direction of evolutionary change. Um, I then showed you some theory that looked at patterns of maternal allocation, um, where I argued that this sort of dichotomy between reproductive compensation and differential allocation is, is, a, is not very useful, um, but that we can better understand empirical patterns of maternal allocation if we think about the ways in which males affect offspring fitness and female fitness. Um, and then I introduced you to the oscillated RAS and made this general argument that we can think about traits 
not, uh, that are sexually selected, not just being these sort of classic things like the male, the peacock's tail or the bright coloration in courtship, but that social interactions and social traits themselves might be sexually selected. So in this system, this male-female reproductive cooperation is potentially under strong sexual selection. and has, We know it has a large effect on both nesting male and satellite male fitness. Um, and so uh, I just want to finish up by returning to that suggestion I made, or that, that point I made, that um, the way that we're currently able to model social interactions, I at least find a little bit limiting. Um, so we, for example, can think about these rea reaction norms and that they might re represent you know, more or less plastic individuals. And the way that people often test these is to look at individuals in two or more different environments and think about how they change their, their phenotype and how that affects fitness. Um, but I have to tell you, I have been trying to explain this theory to the oscillated races for a number of years now. This is me underwater trying to teach them about reaction norms, and they just don't listen. They don't actually behaviorally respond in that simplistic a way. They don't just respond to some social environment that I, that I manipulate for them. They have much greater plasticity and much more rapid changes in their behavior than I can ever really capture in this very limited framework. Um, so as sort of silly as this photograph is, it's meant to capture the idea that I at least argue that this framework is not sufficient for understanding the complexity of a system like that. Um, and even more importantly, perhaps, it's not sufficient to really help us understand the data that we have a greater capacity to, ca to capture. So this is a result um, from a paper we did where we looked at um, transcriptomics, so gene expression in whole brains of these uh, alternative male types. And I want you to worry about the details here. But each of these represents a different, uh, a different gene or gene product. And this is the kind of data we're trying to understand. And that framework is not sufficient at all to help me understand these kind of complex patterns. Um, so maybe I can inspire at least someone in the, in the audience here to help me think about how could we actually um, generate theory that would help us understand the complexity of behaviors that we see in systems like the oscillated RAS and also the increasingly complex data that we have available to us. Um, so with that, I want to thank my collaborators, without whom none of this work would have been possible. Many people hap, uh, helped both in the lab and the field. Uh, funding uh, sources, of course, are also increasingly critical to our scientific success. Um, and most importantly, to all of you for your kind attention. Thank you so much. <laughs>